Hi, this is Charlie Montatiello with another video on making plain and Native American flutes. Today what we're going to do is work on a flute that I was sent by a friend, Jeff, hi Jeff, uh, to uh, take a look at it and see what I could do to fix it. It's a flute from another flute maker and I've covered the name up down here so you can't see who it is because I don't want to put anybody's work down or anything, but uh, this looks very typical of a lot of flute makers that I have seen and honestly I don't recognize the signature so I'm not sure who it is anyway. Um, but I'm going to show you some things that we can do to bring this flute back to life. And I know a lot of you have had these kind of questions. What can you do to make this flute play better, to make it sound better? Um, there's a lot of different things you can do. And uh, you may hear my torch going in the background. And of course you may see the sawdust. It actually takes a lot out of two people making thousands and thousands and thousands of flutes. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so uh, what we're going to do is actually bring this flute here back to life as promised and uh, make it to where Jeff can probably enjoy playing it again. Uh, there's one thing right off the bat that I'm going to tell you that I don't like. The flute itself is approximately um, three, let me see, it's a little larger than three quarters. It's not quite seven eighths, but a little smaller than three quarters in diameter. It's kind of uneven, uh, which is not a problem, by the way. Flutes that are uneven are not really f that big of an issue, but um, the diameter inside and then the fingerings that are used are some of my concerns. So if you'll take a look with me now, we'll check it out and see where we're going. So I looked it over really closely and I realized that the person that made this flute is probably a little older flute uh, because the person that made it used the old, uh, uh, I guess, typical Ben Hunt uh, pattern guide that a lot of us flute makers have heard of or seen or know about and some of you may use that specifically. Uh, it's not a bad guide, it really isn't. As a matter of fact, this flute here Although there's some minor little changes, this is my traditionally tuned and traditionally made um, elderberry flute that I play all over the place. Uh, it's one of my favorite flutes. It is very similar and very close to that field guide's uh, fingerings. However, you know, once again, um, this one's made based on some of the older photos that I've seen. So mine starts off up here at about four inches and then it's about an inch and three sixteenths between each one of the holes. This hole is a little further north because the diameter is a little larger than what it probably should have been. But the diameter of this guy is a lot larger than what it should have been. And, uh, and I'm starting to get into some real testy grounds <laughs> because most of you know how I feel about six hole flutes and how this hole should actually do something uh, other than a half step note or, or whatever you can invent for it to do, which we can invent anything for these holes to do. We've done it. Um, but... Um, the larger diameter throws the position of, really throws the position of all three of these holes off. This hole here should not be placed there, it should actually be placed up here. The larger diameter causes these sets of three, just like two canoes going in opposite directions, uh, drift apart. In either case, he basically used the same four inches from the sound edge to the first hole, and then they're about an inch and three sixteenths between each and every fingering with any, you know, no regards to tuning or what it may sound like. And I do see where there's some holes that have been burned slightly, but I can see down in the hole, I don't know if you can, but only the top of the holes has been burned. The bottoms of the holes have not, which means that the note is going to be the same note whether the hole was burned or not. Because the inside, let me see if I can get a pointy tool here, one of my favorite little files. The inside of this hole here and its placement in distance from the sound edge is what determines the tone of the flute. So the fact that the inside of the hole is not any larger from one to the next means that the tones aren't going to be really any different either. There's maybe minor, minor variations you might find from burning the outside of the hole versus burning the inside of the hole, which is the vital part. In either case, I'm going to leave this third hole to play as it does now because my friend Jeff may be used to it that way and I don't want to take any way, you know, anything away from what you guys have been used to. Uh, I just like to show you my take on things. But what we're going to do um, is actually retune this guy. And I know that's probably what most of you are watching this video for, saying, would you just get on with it? <laughs> and uh, I'd like to first start off by showing you that a really good sounding flute even if it's a six hole or five hole or whatever, usually has a shorter distance between the bottom hole and the bottom of the flute than it does the top hole and really the top of the flute right here where the sound edge is, where the sound begins. The top of the flute is right here. This is all this cosmetic. Um, so this is longer than this is. 
here's an old traditionally tuned four hole flute and we're talking four to eight thousand years worth of experience here on these guys short long this guy here will play notes that these others won't even think of and this one would be of course the next one and then this guy here is limited because of not only the fingering being out of place which you can achieve half notes if that's what you're shooting for by combinations of fingerings or by half covering the holes which is pretty easy but uh, this flute here like I say I'm gonna quit riding that that third hole get off my soapbox anyway um, if you'll notice the distance between here and here is almost identical to the distance between here and there now does that mean that the flute won't play good that way no it doesn't it just means it's not designed perfectly it's best for flutes to have a shorter distance from here to there and a larger distance from here to there the diameter of the flute has some variation and some de determinants on the diameter of the holes not a lot so that's why I don't preach it to you guys and uh, you know it's it's a little bit but the tone that it produces is what's important so this guy having this longer distance down here I've tried to play it. I actually made a little makeshift block for it because Jeff didn't want to have to ship his block to me. And I've got my tuner right now set on 440, which I don't always do, by the way. Most of you know that I don't really care for tuned flutes. But uh, this is what all holes covered sounds like on the tuner. It's kind of a sharp... Um, let me see here. It's a sharp G or flat G sharp, which means that it's not anywhere in between. So I thought well, maybe the guy that was tuning this meant to tune it to 432 hertz. So I tried to tune it down to 432. And it's about 20 cents south of being a G sharp. And just to let you know what I'm talking about, this is plus 20 and that's minus 20. This is flat, that is sharp, this is in the middle where it should be. And um, once again, most of you that follow me and listen to all of my <laughs> comments about traditionally tuning flutes, this thing doesn't really matter one way or the other, but for those of you who don't have the trained ear to hear how I'm going to play it in just a moment, how it should be sounding versus how it is sounding, um, I want to give you something to go by. So I tune it down to 432, which is actually lower than 440, and um, it's still 20 cents flat even if it was a G-sharp or otherwise known as A-flat. Um, so what I'm going to do is put this guy back up to 440. I'm going to leave it on, and we're going to use it in just a moment because he's going to get a perfectly tuned flute back. Um, but I'm going to play it for you. And you're welcome to watch the tuner if you like while I play, or you can just listen. It's all good. The tuner, like I say, I'm going to prop that up there for you again. I think that may have helped a little bit. The tuner may give you an idea of what we're dealing with. And once again, I'm going to keep my finger on that third hole all the time because that's the way this flute's designed. So, your notes start off flat and progressively get sharper on the way up. The top note, the uh, high G sharp or A flat, is really sharp in comparison to the other notes. So I'm going to try something a little different here. I'm going to play it with only half covering all the holes. Please forgive me if I wobble a little bit because it's hard to keep six fingers on holes partially at the same time. So listen to what it's going to sound like. Okay, so you get an idea. Let's partially cover the bottom hole and let's see what it sounds like. So I'm partially covering the bottom hole, if you can see it there in the corner. I've got it covered by the table. And I'm actually tuning this flute down to a G right now. It's not going to be our end product, but that's what we're doing. I'm blowing soft. There is a little wobble. It's because we're choking it up too much. But I'm going to partially uncover these holes. If I can make a note out of it. See, that's almost a good G. I could work with that if, if that's where we were going by simply plugging the bottom of this until I get it tuned to the G and then making sure that each one of the holes are the right size, whether by plugging them and re-drilling and burning them or by making them larger, whatever's necessary. 
You make them larger, they go sharp. You make them smaller, they go flat. It's easy science. Um, but what I'm going to do is, I believe, what the person that made this flute may have been attempting to do in the first place. Um, I'm going to start off by ear and then eventually conventionally tune it uh, to A flat, which I think is what he was probably hoping to do. And I may need to do something a little different to this top note. So I'm going to cut some off the bottom because A flat is a little too flat. And I'm only going to take a little bit right here. As you'll read in my book here um, on flute making, typically the width that you want to cut off of the bottom of a flute to change it um, one whole step, typically, and this is within reason anyway, anything from half inch in diameter up to seven eighths of an inch in diameter, maybe an inch in diameter, typically, if you want to take it a whole step higher, you usually cut off the full diameter in length. Like this thing here is about seven eighths or three quarters or what have you, cut off about seven eighths or three quarters. You just moved it a half step sharper. So what I'm going to do is take off just a smidgen, just about a, maybe a eighth or a quarter of an inch there, and we'll see what it sounds like. A lot of you may be thinking at home, oh no, he just cut that beautiful flute. <laughs> I know that's the way you would feel, and thank you, Jeff, very much for giving me the opportunity to use this one in this demonstration I've been looking forward to. So a quarter of an inch took off um, about 40 cents. Let's cut it one more quarter of an inch. See what this sounds like. It's got a little wobble on it, but that's actually a, a G sharp right there. That's not too shabby. Um, one thing I really seen that I wanted to do here on this flute, and I'm going to have to carefully take the block off so that you can't see who made it, because once again, I don't want to put down anybody's work knowingly or directly. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Anyway, not really putting down his work anyway. He's undoubtedly one of the beginning flute makers from back in the day, and this is where we're at. It's a good flute. It's a really good flute. I'm not unhappy with it. This is what I want to show you, and uh, it might be a little tricky. Okay, here's something I can use. Here's a file that I'm going to use to show you. I don't know if any of you have ever had any machine work done, like for a car or something. But one thing they do in a machine shop to check to see how flat a piece of metal is, and people are thinking, oh, well, metal's not always flat? No. <laughs> is you put a flat edge against it. So this is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to show you, and if I can have you zoom in on it right there. You'll notice that there is a very tiny little gap. Not only right here, that part doesn't matter so much, but there's a little tiny gap where the edge of this flute, and maybe if we focused in on it and just zoomed in a little bit more on that piece, you'll be able to see it. This is where that wobble sound is coming from. And it's not the warble that so many of you believe that old Indian people sought after. That's caused by something else. We may talk about it one day, but I really don't see it necessary. Um, this knife edge is lower than the air supply edge. This is shooting air up and over instead of right on it. It needs to go right on it. And there are a number of ways we can correct that. We can use a file and just file this until it's back far enough that the edge lines right up. We can use my burning tools, of course. Um, we could fill it in and then file it. That would make sure that we stayed at the same position because this actually determines the, the tone, what sound the flute is making, whether it's an A, B, C, or D type thing. But that really needs to be corrected. That's where that bottom note warble is coming from, or wobble, rather. I don't know which one I should call it. So I'm going to just grab a file first and see how soft this pine is, if it'll, if it'll file easy enough. Looks like not. 
this is a fine jeweler's file anyway. So let's use a burning tool on it. Just take a second on that. The burning tool I was anticipating using was the one to change the tone of the holes. So we'll get to it in just a minute. But like I said, very important that the air coming out of this dude hits that knife edge right there smack straight on. Right now the knife edge is below the level of where the air edge is. So we've got to correct that. Um, you know, if your flute's like that and you don't feel comfortable messing with that part, I really recommend don't, don't mess with that part because you could easily change everything by changing that. On this particular flute, you know, and it's the only time I've seen someone else's flute that, that had made that uh, calculation and maybe he meant it to be that way. I'm not sure. You know, maybe, maybe this person's obsessed with the warble that uh, he believed that's what he's shooting for, but actually what's happening is creating a mistone in there. The air, and I'll tell you this while my rod's heating up, it's almost done. The air is shooting up above this thing, and uh, studying physics really will teach you that, that that creates a vacuum, not a not an air sound. So this flute is probably going to be a lot louder whenever it's completed, when we're done with our little upgrade, than it is right now. Because right now, the wind blowing atop of this is actually sucking air from inside of it and causing it to circulate around in circles. Once again, maybe that's what he was shooting for, I'm not sure. But that's not the way it's going to be. This is going to be a really clear, beautiful sounding flute. Okay, so we don't need a whole lot of heat on this guy, just a little bit. And what I'm doing is I'm refocusing the position of this knife edge. Hopefully my big head's not in your way. Not only am I refocusing the position, see that took off a smidgen there. I'm also redefining the ramp inside because currently the ramp is just a tiny little edge and is straight down. Which uh, I guess in modern days we realize it makes a very fine sounding flute when the ramp is very long and gradual. It gives the air less resistance to follow down. And resistance is what causes this thing to play. It's when I was telling you about plugging the end of it up. Uh, that's air pressure, back pressure, resistance that we're creating. Resistance makes the notes lower. Um, it impedes the flow of air. Come on guys, Bernoulli's Law, Physics 101. Y'all should read, know that by now, right? So, I'm just going to straighten this little edge here, just a smidgen. I haven't smelled that kind of wood glue in a while. Just want to make sure I'm careful with that. I'm going to leave that rod heating up for just a moment. I see that the edge is probably a little bit closer now. Not perfectly close, but, but a little bit closer. I think I'm going to burn this level of the track down just a smidgen because I see some cracks and some unusual looking gouges. You guys can see that picture that we had just put up. You might want to rewind it if you want to look in it. There's uh, some serious uneven uh, gouge over here, probably caused by something accidentally. This thing here was, you know, this part was whittled out with a pocket knife or with a exacto or some type of hobby knife. Um, this line over here pokes out too far. We're going to square all that up a little bit and then make sure that the track area is nice and flat, nice and smooth. Let's see. What would be terrible is if I told you guys all this stuff and built your confidence up in me and then it turned out bad. <laughs> oh, I have my fears. Hopefully they're misplaced, but uh, let's see. <laughs> Make sure I get that little tiny piece of funk in there out. There we go. Let's see if it sounds any different, just right off the bat. Talk 
top note still really sharp and by the looks of it we're just barely hitting the knife edge at the angle we want to so I'm going to take this track area down just a smidgen and maybe bring that out just another little tiny bit now you guys know a smidgen is an actual unit of measure right it's like a pinch of sugar Once again, I'm doing all this, like maybe not even a half a millimeter at the time, so. A lot of you are trying burning tools for the first time, and you're thinking a half a millimeter? How do you keep it from burning off so much? Well, let's practice. Don't get it too hot. Let's see. Wow. I knew we were going to hit the spot there eventually where it just opened up and started singing. I'm going to go ahead and burn. You see all these little tiny bits of burr here? That may not seem like a restriction. There's a nice one right there. Some of it's fallen in. If we clean all that off with the burning tool, man, I tell you what, the sound quality should change night and day. So let's do that. Okay, let's do that. A little bit of this. Pinch of nutmeg. Yeah, let's see. Happy little flutes. I have to tell you, I've never in my life watched a single episode of Bob Ross. My wife has, which is probably the reason she married me. <laughs> I've uh, never watched a single episode of it. But there's this video on YouTube you can find uh, made by a group called Melody Sheep where they redub Bob Ross singing a song out of his videos. And, and i got to tell you, that right there alone sold me on Bob Ross and his skills. Man, I tell you what, he really, he had the whole thing down. I'm not sure if he was some kind of Zen monk or what, but he was a really peaceful dude. So, we've got a lot of it cleaned up. I still see some tiny little fibers in here. Happy little fibers. <laughs> anyway, we need to clean those guys up just a smidgen. I guess this makes two smidgens, right? That. Some of this. A little bit of that. Go back over your spots where you hit them the first time because you may have turned up a piece of wood that needs to be hit again. So there we go. I'm going to put that burning tool away. I have a feeling it's done its job, although we want it to anyway. Notice I didn't change it size of this too much I did take it from about here to there so we took off not quite a, a millimeter probably really close close to a millimeter maybe three quarters of a millimeter or something all that kind of stuff makes a difference hopefully I haven't revealed that signature on the bottom I know Jeff didn't mind but I just I don't know I don't want it to seem like I'm putting down this guy's work when I'm not this dude was one of the undoubtedly one of the pioneers of early flute making and this is not just a piece of leather lace. This is just a scrap I picked up off the floor in the shop. Which I guess it's been a week. We probably need to go back and clean the shop again. Okay. Got it tied on there. Okay, so none of you can read this signature, right? <laughs> Anyways, we have the edge of the block right at the back edge of the sound hole. Let's see if it changes the tone. Now that top note's almost an A. Even my C there is a little sharper. My C sharp rather is a little sharper than what it was. You can see this. So let's see. The G sharp's way up here. So the G-sharp, normally, I would come in with something and plug it, and just, you know, you just have to bring it down a little bit. So watch my finger. That's almost half covering the hole. Uh, it wouldn't be very difficult at all to find a small piece of sawgrass or river cane laying around this shop that I can put in there with a restriction that would be maybe twice the diameter of my little 
tool here, but I really think, and A is a real common, common tone to be putting flutes in, I really think that's what I want to do. Not to mention, when I'm looking at this, this flute's an A, really close anyway, and you can see, let's move it down to there, the bottom of this guy is still a little bit on the long side, so I'm thinking if I cut it right about there, it's probably going to be an A. Um, let's listen to it one more time while I look at the tuner. I'm going to move the block down a little bit and see if we can edge that wobble out. Let's try but it may still be some of the um, tone of the backdraft of this flute, the restriction down here of it being a little bit long. I'm blowing soft, I can make it perfect A sharp. Low and soft, I can almost make this flute an A sharp, or excuse me, a G sharp or A flat. But still, I feel like most people blow a little harder than I do. See, that B should be a C if this was going to be A. It's going there, it's trying to make a C. And that C sharp or D flat should be a D. Which is trying to get there. And if I blow hard, not too hard, that top note really turns into an A immediately. So we're not going to burn that hole out no matter what. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a little bit off the bottom. We'll go from there. Okay, so you kind of see what it takes to get a really warbly, sharp um, A flat to be an A, and listen to the tone quality different. Five cents is good by anybody's standards. Usually I get them right on the money, but sometimes uh, the tone of the flute is actually how you're blowing, or it could be something inside of it. I notice when I'm using my burning tools, if I get any uh, smoke inside of there, the notes are completely flat compared to what they'll be after the smoke blows out. So, just FYI, you guys. Five cents, man. I tell you what, that's not too shabby. Uh, let's see what the next note, the C, should be. Kind of a flat C, which, as I said, we simply... Uh, Burn it with our burning tool. Blow that smoke out so that it's not causing the air to do funny. Just a little larger. If you notice, I always play the first note um, with all holes covered and then play the next note when I'm tuning the flute. You'll also notice, when I tune the next hole, I cover all holes, then I cover this one, and I uncover this one, then I uncover the two. The reason I do that is I'm checking... That would seem really flat. Or five cents is almost ten cents, and that's going to drive me nuts. So let me sand the end off just a smidgen. Okay, use my Dremel to get the burrs out. Let's see what it sounds like. Hey, how about that? Perfect on the money. That one's 10 cents. All 
I also asked my buddy if it's okay for me to sand and relacquer this flute, so don't you worry about this part. If I was retuning an antique flute or one that, you know, granted, I don't know how comfortable I'd always feel redoing something that's from forever ago, but if I was retuning a flute that had some serious value that didn't need to be uh, done like this, there are other methods. Ten cents. You can see about how big the hole is. It's just a little larger than five sixteenths right there. Let me get my tool once more. And since I've got the hole nice and round and about the size I like, instead of burning it larger, I'm going to burn the edge out underneath the top of the hole. scar tissue off in just a little while Our D is a little bit on the flat side too of course so we're gonna burn that hole out Okay, now that we're putting the finishing touches on these last couple of holes, you'll notice as we've been working on this hole here that the top two holes have become sharper and sharper, and this one here is reaching its A really close, so we've got to be careful not to overshoot our A that we're trying to achieve here. And I'm just going to clean out the little bit there. This hole, I'd like to say that I don't know what to do with it. I just don't know what to do with it with my mindset. I really think I should probably plug it. Might be pretty if it had a little stone in there. I don't think Jeff minds, so... We may go that direction. feels like it's just a smidgen too long and I tell you what I'm gonna do is just dremel just the bottom a little bit let's see if that changes any okay that's better <laughs> what I've done is I've gone ahead and, and uh, sanded it because I wanted you to see the size of the hole so that you know that this guy here is not really that big it's not too bad feels good in my finger that way um, but uh, these two guys this one I didn't tune a bit this one is uh, just a smidgen that I had to go because the size of this hole really made up for it I'm gonna play it for you So anyway, that's what you got to do sometimes to make sure this guy is not just in tune, but sounds good. Um, tuning by ear really is what I prefer to do, and I think it sounds good tuned by ear. Uh, there's some little variances, like this guy's still a little bit flat, this one's still a little bit sharp, but it sounds good, and that's what matters. I mean, that's what this whole thing's about, right? And that little bit of... Uh, 
sharp sound that it's got there still being caused by this but I didn't want to take that away too much part of it may be because the inside diameter really needs this uh, um, sound hole to be about a quarter of an inch instead of three-eighths like it is five sixteenths would have been good uh, but right now it's about three-eighths of an inch wide and it really needed to be about uh, five sixteenths or a quarter of an inch wide instead if it were it would sound I think the sound quality would be a little bit better but it's a good flute it's, as I said from the beginning it was a good flute to start with um, I'm gonna sand the rest of this off I'm gonna put a little stone in there for my friend I think he'll really like and he'll have a beautiful five hole flute tuned to the key of A that uh, I think sounds really good. I'll oil the inside of it too, which helps a tremendous amount. But anyway, hope you like this little tip that we uh, give you today. And once again, this is Charlie Montatiella signing out for another video on Native American flute making. Please visit us on our Facebook, which is uh, Blue Bear Arts or Blue Bear Flutes. You can find us a bunch of different ways there now. We even have a little Facebook group uh, where some other friends are kind of keeping up with some flute ideas and, and what have you, and they're pretty, pretty astute, <laughs> to say the least. And then also our website, which is bluebearflutes.com. Uh, so happy flute making and keep up the good work, y'all.